Do you think life is simpler as time evolves? For some, it can be more complicated when facing issues about health, estate plans, probate, long-term care, and more. That's why attorney CPA Joe Cordell hosts Elder Talk with Tucker Allen, providing intelligent answers for those thinking about their future. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Elder Talk. This week, we're having as a guest someone with which you are familiar, those of you who listen or watch this this podcast regularly, Don O'Brien with the Better Business Bureau. You'll recall that he has told us about scams that that we need to watch out for, especially as we age over the last, what, four to five years. He's been right. guests on and off. And we talked uh, last time with him about things that were going on during the height of the coronavirus. Exactly. Which the, I hope is starting to appear in our rearview mirror. I'm we'll hoping. We'll see. Yeah. But there are still things, human nature being what it is, there are still people out there looking to prey on those who are older especially. So toward that end, we want to talk about some some more current things to watch out for on the horizon. Maybe you can kind of lead us into this discussion. Yeah. Too. Uh, warm weather scams. And and we're all, we all know about the storm chasers. And Don, you know, these bad actors, they don't take spring break. They don't take a summer vacation. They're out there operating in full force. In fact, the warm season proves to be very profitable for these bad actors. It does, Jill, unfortunately. And thanks thanks again for having me. I love coming on and talking with you and Joe about uh, these things. And we want to make sure we keep seniors. We want to keep make sure it's better business for all. We keep everyone safe. But the senior citizen uh, uh, population is one we really want to make sure that we keep safe because, uh, you know, while they are vulnerable to scams, uh, they are more vulnerable in terms of money lost into these types of things. And once we have these storm chasers go from town to town and they and they may find a uh, a neighborhood or community that's especially hard hit, uh, they may go looking for some of those homes where the sure. seniors live in and uh, try to take advantage of them. So it's really important for people, if they have some type of weather event, will be it flood, be it some type of wind event, uh, heaven forbid we have any kind of uh, uh, tornadoes around here in the next uh, you know month or so, uh, we want to make sure that you keep your kind of your antennae up to make sure you don't get taken advantage of. So how do these people typically approach their prey? Is it by phone? Is it by email? Do they knock on the door? I think a lot of it, Joe, is what you said that's the very last. Uh, you know, we see very little, uh, you know, so many of the scams I've talked to with you guys about over the years has been uh, a lot of computer scams. And uh, so much of this is the, the, the rare face-to-face scam. And uh, where they'll, again, they'll, they'll see a hard-hit area. They'll pull up stakes from where they used to be in whatever hard hit area they were in, and they'll go to that new place. And uh, if, if our area uh, is is hit by storms, you can guarantee they're going to come. And uh, uh, the one thing that you can do to kind of um, help yourself, help protect yourself against these people, and those solicitors especially, they're going to come into your door. Know the solicitation rules of your community. A lot of municipalities say that you must have some type of uh, identification, A not only for your company. But that municipality may also issue some type of uh, solicitor's permit. So know the rules of your town or the county that you live in. Or the homeowners um, association, right? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. With, without a doubt. I mean, we had a we had an instance last year where I saw some folks circulating around my neighborhood where I lived on the, on the east side of Illinois, on the east side of the river over in Illinois. And uh, they didn't have the proper credentialing. So what I did is, again, this may sound a little bit overkill, but I called my city police department on the non-emergency number. And I said, hey, you have these people circulating in this area right now that aren't permitted to do this. They don't have the proper solicitor's permits. And credit to my police department, they went out and they, they, and, and they talked to those folks. So that's the first thing you can do is to make sure that you know the rules and the laws of solicitor's permits. Now, you know, the little girl who's coming to sell her sell the Girl Scout cookies, that's one thing. We, we uh, shouldn't have know, her arrested. No, not the girl, <laughs> especially if she has thin mints. Uh-huh. I like what Jill's thinking because the thin mints are the best. You know, but that's, you know, that's one thing. If you have a kid selling pizzas for his or her school, that's another thing. But, you know, when you have these people who's, you know, their job is supposedly to help you in this time of need, well, you really need to – uh, investigate them and look into them before you decide to sign any kind of contract. Because uh, as as we've talked about, uh, they go from one town to another and 
it's important to get as much info out of these people as you can about them so you can make a wise decision. So uh, tell us how this, though, goes down. Uh, what What is their pitch? Is their intention to get you to sign a contract and give them a check for work that's to be done in the future? Tell us what are the common denominators of these scams. Yeah, you know, the number one thing they're trying to do is to get money out of you. And whether that's uh, saying they're going to come back tomorrow and do the work if you pay them today, or uh, you know whether they'll say, well, we'll come back tomorrow and we'll try, we'll, we'll try to work out some type of deal with you. They just want to get that money, or they want to try to work with your insurance company to get that money if there's an actual, um, if there's an actual insurance claim that they can make. Um, and what we hear from a lot of consumers is that they'll get into business with these people. They'll work with the, ins- the these companies will work with their insurance company. They'll get that payment and they either A, will never show up again, or B, they'll, they'll, they'll do very minimal work and let's just leave the job because another uh, weather emergency pops up and they go on to the next, the next place to try to take advantage of those people. And, you know, I noticed too, they try to create this sense of alarm and, and they use these scare tactics. I remember about four years ago, and it was literally five, 10 minutes after the severe thunderstorm And this guy shows up at our door, claims he's with a roofing company and wanted to go up on our roof and telling us, you know, all these terrible things could be wrong with our roof because of the severity of that storm that just rolled through. Well, of course, we didn't let him up on our roof. But I could see where people would fall for that. And especially especially when usually during that pitch, they say something to the effect that, you know, we're working through your neighborhood. We've been working with your neighbors down the street, Yes, which may or may not be true. It may be that the neighbor did fall for it first, uh, but but you get this sense that, oh, they're okay because they're dealing with others in our neighborhood. Um, So one thing I'm wondering is you have involved here an insurance company. Now, these are professionals. Uh, they should be better equipped to anticipate and to deal with these problems. I'm a little surprised that that these insurance companies who are victims too here, to the extent mm-hmm. that they issue checks and there's no benefit that's that that that's uh, enjoyed by their client, why are they not more capable of protecting themselves? Why, well, you know, that's a good question, Joe. That's one that I really don't have an answer for, but. Uh, uh, you know, those insurance companies, they're just trying to do what they can to make sure that their that their customers whole. They want to try to help their customer at the time of need. And the customer's saying, okay, go ahead and give ABC XQV roofing this check because they're going to do business for me. That's what they're going to do. They're going to they're they're going to make sure that they're that their customer is taken care of. And that too often that customer just turns that check right over to that bad uh, bad actor and that that money is gone. They may uh, endorse it to them. Even though the check might be endorsed to, to, to you, Joe, you may say, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, on the side of it, pay to the order of, um, you know, ABC XQ roofing, and then boom, they're gone and they've got your money. So right. uh, there might be more the insurance company can do, but at the same time, the insurance uh, company is just trying to make sure that, that their customer is taken care of. Okay. Th- this kind of makes sense for me uh, now as I think about it. it. Then I guess that the insurance company that has a duty – to compensate the homeowner for damage. And mm-hmm. if in fact there was some sort of damage, which if, if this if their timing's correct, they're coming into areas, into neighborhoods when there's been some weather event and, and presumably there is some damage. So so whenever they provide documentation to the insurance company, the insurance company, let's assume, is diligent and confirms, okay, there's some damage to the roof. So their contract just requires them to compensate the homeowner. So if they've sent the check to the homeowner, then the insurance company has fulfilled its obligations under its contract. Has done their job. Now, if the homeowner is foolish enough to, as you say, sign that check over or in some other fashion, pay these people for work that they never, ever do, then um, I can see why the insurance company will take the position, look, we did what we were supposed to do. Yeah. And that's why it's so important for you to know who you're dealing with. And when I talked earlier about getting as much information about the company that you're dealing with as possible is good because, um, you know, as as you guys know, our office here, our BBB office here in St. Louis is really aggressive about letting people know who the bad actors are. If you get an F rating with us, F is a fail, uh, there's a pretty good chance that we're going to put out a consumer warning about the business, letting people know that, hey, 
uh, and I'm just totally making this up, this, this company name up. So if there's an ABC XQV row thing out there, I apologize <laughs> in advance, but I'm just using random letters. But we'll let people know that, hey, this co- you may want to use cost when you use this company, and we always name the owner of the company if we can find it. We find it important for the owner of the company's name to be in there for the simple fact that uh, Joe Schmo, who's the owner of that company, well, Joe Schmo may create another company yeah. after ABC XQV Roofing has got an F rating. He's all in the style going to have uh, Schmo Roofing out, and uh, you know they may relocate to supposedly South Carolina or somewhere. And um, you know, so you've really got again as much information you can get out of these companies. And believe it or not, a lot of them, uh, not a lot, some of the bad ones will claim that they're accredited with a Better Business Bureau. Well, again. Look them up on BBB.org to see if Schmo Roofing's with the Better Business Bureau. If you don't see a Schmo Roofing on BBB and an accredited business logo on its page, it's probably not an accredited business with us. Right. And then again, that's just another layer of the deceit that they try to sell, especially to senior citizens who really see BBB as a force uh, to trust. I mean, I think you know we, our, our logo is start with trust. And our senior population really, you know, because they've dealt with us for many years, uh, uh, you know, they they tend to believe that if somebody's accredited with BBB, that they're legitimate. But you want you have to make sure that they're actually with BBB. Right. What percentage of the victims are senior c- citizens? Would you say? Well, I don't know that I could per- put a percentage on it. I what I can say, Jill, is that the senior citizens, uh, when they do get s- sunk into scams like that. They lose a lot more money uh, than, than than what the, what than what maybe somebody younger might might lose, um, just for the simple fact that uh, you know they're so trusting. So much of senior folks, sixty five and older, the handshake they did money by the handshake right. and, and and you know word of mouth and you know they believe someone's word. And unfortunately today you just can't do that as often no. as you used to 25, 30, 40 years ago. So. Um, you know, I can't put a percentage on it, but, uh, you know, they do tend to lose a lot in these schemes. It seems to be a common denominator as we talk about the focus of the Better Business Bureau's attention on things that are some sort of fraud or some sort of scam. It seems that whether it's on the internet, whether it's by mail, a relative is in trouble. We've talked about that scenario. A grandchild, you know, is needing money. And then now we're talking about homeowner victimization. It seems like the common denominator is that these people recognize that there's a better chance of of pulling this off with someone that's older. And that probably is a little bit, there probably is truth in that assumption. Uh, it And people are more vulnerable as they age. So I, I'm not surprised to hear you say that it's perhaps a majority plus of your, of the people you help. It is. And again, they have, you know, the, the older you are, the more wealth you accumulate, you know, that's kind of the, the, the prevailing sure. thought. So, you know, if you can find somebody who's 75 who needs a roof and all of a sudden you might say, oh, well, you've got these other problems too. Uh, let me help you with that. And they might, you know, kind of milk the cow a little bit for, for lack of a better term, where somebody who's younger in their thirties or forties may be, but again, I'm not saying that, that, that older Americans aren't, aren't sharp and they, they, they are, but uh, you know, Again, they're trusting. If somebody says to them who they see as an expert that these things need to be done, they're going to say, okay, well, I believe this person. He or she seems like a good person. I'm going to trust them. I'm going to go with their, I'm going to go with their uh, thoughts. And when that happens, that's when they've got them hooked in and they can get them for a lot of money. And I imagine um, most of this money through these scams is never recovered. No. I mean, again, the, 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 the way that you could get, um, you know, if you're able to sue them in a, in a small claims court, possibly, or if, the, you know, if let's say a storm chaser came through here in Missouri and uh, the Missouri AG attorney general's office heard a lot of, of a lot of complaints. Uh, the Missouri attorney general's office has been pretty aggressive on consumer issues. So uh, Eric Schmidt's office might go after those folks and do it. It's not a class action suit, but if you've been harmed by that business, you could be entitled to some restitution should the state. Uh, you know, find that they violated, let's say, the Merchandising Practices Act. And, uh, you know, they might be able to get money back there. But again, that is a, you know, that's a Hail Mary a lot of times. And you're right, Joe, once you, unless, of course, by some way, these people took a credit card from you and credit card information, you have some some, some built-in protections there. But once you give that $7,000 check over to that business for the 
for the home improvement they are going to do for you, right? That money's as good as gone. Yeah. Now, do these um, type of scams with senior citizens? Do they normally get reported by the victim themselves, or do you find that the victim's children learn about this situation and contact you? Yeah, it, it's, it's kind of a mix. Uh, you know, if, usually if somebody is, uh, um, you know, probably. I'm going to say if they're 80 and under, it's usually the person. If it's 80 or up, sometimes we'll hear from the children who say, hey, you know, my mom or dad, they got they got caught in this thing. This guy came by the thing, came by our house after a storm and said we needed all this done. And they just they just took the money and didn't do anything. We hear that a lot. So it's really important uh, uh, to kind of check on, you know, if you have an, an older loved one who's living by themselves, whether it's a grandparent or a parent or an aunt or an uncle or whatever it might be. Uh, you know, just again, check on them to make sure, especially after storm, A, they're okay. And B, if there's something wrong with the residence, let's say they've got a tree that's falling down uh, and they're going to have a contractor come out and cut down that, cut up that tree and cut it down, that they get together with a reputable business to do that. Because again, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about roofing and things like that, but there's all kinds of stuff that, uh, uh, that you know, that could go wrong. Let's say a, a flood comes through and washes out someone's gravel driveway or uh, you know, somebody's going to come along and say, oh, hey, guess what? You need a new driveway and we'll, let's let's put this asphalt down for you. We see a lot of that kind of stuff, too. So, right. again, check on your older ones, especially if uh, uh, maybe they're super seniors or, you know, once you know, the older they are, the more you want to check on them to make sure they're safe. And talking about tree removal, that's very expensive. And I've heard, too, where these con artists come around and they offer to remove a tree for way less than what it typically cost. Well, they're not going to really remove that tree. They're going to say, uh, you know, I'll do it for this amount that the victim gives them that money in cash or a check, whatever the case may be. They take off, your tree's still there. Yep, yep, we hear a lot about that. And, uh, you know, the one thing to be, again, that's that's more of a going to be a door-to-door solicitation. And Joe made a really good point earlier when he talked about how uh, these scammers will use the neighbor as kind of a cover and say, oh, I'm working for your neighbor down the street. Yeah. Well, when they say that to you, say, OK, well, who, which one of my neighbors are you working with? Because, uh, you know, you can easily just walk down the street and say to your neighbor, hey, are you working with these guys? And what's your experience like? Uh, more than likely, uh, they're probably not working with your neighbor. And uh, that's just a ruse that, again, to try to play on your emotions. They may, again, in a situation of a tree, they may say, oh, you've got a dangerous limb hanging here and we need to get this done pronto. So if you give me $300 today, I can take care of that for you tomorrow. Well, they're going to take you $300 and never come back. Right. Um, and, you and you know, know, if they're not in the up and up. It is surprising what big variations exist even among what I assume are honest bidders, maybe not equally competent, yeah. but but not falling outside legality. So we'll assume it's not fraud. We had recently got a bid on removing a tree in our yard. And the lowest bid we got was 8000 bucks, And then we got another bid and it was 22000 Wow. What a difference. So, I mean, th- this, this posed some risk. So when you have people who are who suspect that you've gotten a higher bid, I mean, they can come in real low if they're willing to risk your neighbor's house. Yes. Uh, and and I think that clearly these guys who are going to go in there for seven or 8000 I, I, I instantly, I don't think they were going to take the money and run. First of all, they didn't have the money. I think their intention really was to take a risk. And if it goes sideways and lands on the roof of the neighbor's right. house, say, oh, well, I'm sorry. And, and what's their worst downside? They don't get paid. Uh, yeah. So, so for them, and, and th- this is a straying a little bit from the classic scenario of a con person, but it does speak to these contractors who come to your house that don't have insurance typically. I mean, you yeah. should, if you confirm that they have insurance coverage, then at least in that scenario, if they undertake this $8,000 project that should have cost a lot more, which means they're going to have maybe two guys in a truck doing it mm-hmm. versus this team and the sort of equipment you'd otherwise have, uh, the buckets, you know, that go sure. away. I'm sure these mm-hmm. guys didn't own that piece of equipment. So at least you know if they have this insurance that, that, that there's some place to turn for payment. Right. So they may be incompetent, uh, but, but in that scenario, we're assuming that they're not dishonest. So insurance protects us. Um, another question, I guess, that should commonly come up among homeowners, would you say? Without a doubt, you want to make sure these folks are insured. Uh, so that way, uh, 
you know, if something does go wrong and, uh, you know, the, the tree falls on your neighbor's fence, let alone their house, that would be awful. But if, you know, it crushes their fence that, you know, that, uh, you know, they're going to stand behind that and they're going to, and they're going to make that insurance claim and it's not going to go on to you. And that's, you know, we're all talking about stuff here, Joe and Jill, that you need to get in a contract. If you're going to have any type of work done, that contract needs to be from A to Z, uh, you know, cost, how long is it going to take? Who's going to be responsible for cleanup? Believe it or not, we hear a lot of things, especially in the tree trimming uh, industry where people just cut down the tree and they just leave it. They just leave the, the a branches. Lot of the, yes. A lot of the, a lot of the, the, the junk behind. Uh, so again, you're going to want to know, uh, you know, dot every I and cross every T and make sure that you read that contract. And it's uh, uh, very important that both sides know what's going to happen. Both the consumer and that contractor on what's expected out of each one of them. Um, because uh, again, uh, we talk a lot about contractors, but as a consumer, you want to make sure that you do good to them. Uh, never pay all of it up front. Pay in thirds, like we've talked about on here before. You're going to pay a third to start, maybe a third when they, a third up front, a third when they start to work, and that final third only when both sides are satisfied with everything and, and the job is done. When that goes, when you when you follow those rules and you get the contract, you don't have all these headaches that we're talking about from some of these uh, bad actors who might be in these fields. Right. And and I think we could safely say that a rule of thumb should be, whether it pertains to the storm chasers or others who might approach, come to the door selling something, is to have a rule of thumb that you never sign anything on the first occasion, nor do you give money on the first occasion. I mean, if they're bona fide, they should be willing to give you their card, uh, give you their estimate or their bid for the work done in writing. So they leave with you a piece of paper in which they, they've stated what it right. is, that, that that document would have their contact information. And then you have a few days. And, and then that's the opportunity for an older person especially to be able to follow up, maybe, you know, check with the Better Business Bureau, see what it, is there a rating, uh, maybe have their adult son or daughter to come and look at it. I, I would be willing to bet that if you did have a poll or a percentage of the number of cases where there was a victim, that there was money that changed hands then and there at that initial meeting, whether it's a phone call, even on the phone, we talked about that before, yeah. people pull out the credit card. Sure. But but even in these door to door, I bet that most of the substantial majority involved somebody who was asked to give money then and there, and they did, or to sign a contract then and High there. High pressure sales. I can only give you this price today. Tomorrow it's going to go up. Yeah, yes. all your neighbors. I'm you know I'm only in town for a few days. We have a lot of of, of houses to do in your neighborhood. Um, you know if you if we don't go ahead and put you on the list now, then we may not be able to get to you. Yeah, you guys touched on a lot of great points there. And again, if and that's that, that's a great rule of thumb, Joe. If somebody's asking for you money up front and says, if you don't take this, like Jill said, if you don't take this deal now, you're not going to get it. Well, that should be, even though it sounds like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do if this person doesn't get to me right now? Believe me, just take, take a breath, uh, still ask for their business card. And again, like you said earlier, if they're a legitimate business, they're going to circle back to you the next day and say, okay, uh, Mr. Cordell, do you have any other questions? You know, let's talk about what we talked about yesterday. Uh, you know, they're not going to put you on the spot right then if they're if they are a legitimate business. That's you know, that's that's a red flag that shows you that that business may not be operating uh, ethically. Good. Before we wrap up today, I want to take a few minutes and circle back and and talk more generally. Are there other things that have gone on, especially related to healthcare, since we last talked? And it wouldn't it wouldn't hurt to revisit some of these things we've talked about just quickly in the past that we know are still current, they're still active, and that our listeners need to be careful and 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 be especially careful to not fall into these traps. We're gonna take about a one minute break. We'll be right back in a moment with Elder Talk with Don O'Brien of the Better Business Bureau. Back in a moment. We were lost. We were in our overhead, we knew it, and we needed help. She had dementia and probably Alzheimer's. And you're not prepared for it at all. Tucker Allen was helpful in making decisions about end of life care, power of attorney for financial care, things I never even would have thought of. They were very thorough, very warm. That warm helped us all relax in a very difficult situation. It was a great relief.
Welcome back to Elder Talk. Uh, we're talking with Don O'Brien of the Better Business Bureau. And we, before we went into the break, uh, we were talking about the fact that scams have occurred in a variety of ways during this crazy last year that we've had. And, and older people tend to be high percentages of the victims. Let's shift gears from what we were talking about before, and let's talk about things that people should be careful about, especially seniors, uh, regarding health care or qualifying for benefits or establishing that they've they've had the, the vaccine, which is a particularly hot topic right now, people scurrying to get this done. So what does the landscape look like now and what suggestions might you give relating to coronavirus for our viewers? So as, as we've talked about on here with you guys for the last year, I mean, we've just seen this, this pandemic has been a playground for the scammers. They have kind of, as this pandemic has gone from one end to the other, uh, we've seen different we've seen different things. It started out with personal protective equipment scams where people selling fake masks and right. things like that to testing scams to uh, economic impact payments, EIP payments, the stimulus money is uh, is is what you know we've seen stimulus scams too. And uh, and now I guess what we're bracing for now that all these vaccines are going into the arms, and the possibility of vaccine passports is what is that going to look like? Uh, now I know the governor of Missouri has come out and said he's not going to require vaccine passports. Yes. On the on the Illinois side of the river, they're talking about you know the the governor over there is probably for vaccine passports. Wait, let, let me interrupt you. Explain what yeah. what these passports are. I don't think that some people are following what that whole okay. discussion. So been. that for to to, make, to keep it simple, a vaccine passport just basically says that okay, you've been vaccinated. You've either got the one shot Johnson and Johnson. Or you've done either one of the two shot regimens and you're cleared. You've 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 taken both of those and you're vaccinated against the coronavirus. Now some businesses may require that for you to go in. Uh, the governor of Missouri, Governor Parsons, has said, you know what, I'm not going to require businesses to do that. But that doesn't stop someone from saying, oh, hey, in my business, if you want to eat your dinner here, you have to show that you're that you're vaccinated. Uh, and I don't know how they're going to do that. Whether it's going to be digitally, whether you're going to just basically show that piece of paper that you got from the from the CDC saying that you got your passport or that you got your vaccine, excuse me. We don't know what that's going to look like. But that but would seem to be practical, wouldn't it? I mean, I understand the idea that the concept makes sense. In other words, if you want to let people sit in the dining room and be able to use your whole dining room if you're a restaurant owner, or I heard that the airlines are complaining that they think passports are a good idea. They just don't want to have to pay for the policing, I guess, of that. And I don't know what that, I think it's a matter of what documentation, but, but we can all agree that it is a great concept so that you can identify the people that shouldn't have to mask. They shouldn't have to be segregated. You know, when you get the vaccine, you want to resume your life. And I don't know how, how, what better way there is for people to be able to resume their life than to say, look, I have a card. Here's my card. So, you know, I'm, I'm uh, fine to come into your restaurant. I'm fine to come into your store uh, to be with employees in a room. Uh, right. But there's going to be those folks that aren't going to want to get a vaccine. And then, Don, wouldn't they get the fake vax, vaccine card online just as a lot so, of people you know, get like a fake degree that. online? We've actually, yes, that's a good point. We've actually had, we had one report last month over in the Springfield, Missouri area of somebody on Facebook for $5, all of $5, you could, you could have a, uh, one of those, one of those cards. You've seen people, uh, one of the CDC vaccine cards, you could get that mailed to them. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden you just filled out with your own information and it looks like you've gotten your, your vaccine. And it doesn't look like it'd be a difficult card. Oh, to no. Counterfeit. No, not at all. I mean, you'd think it'd be a card, like a driver's license. You get it. It's a little complicated. Sure. But those cards are just a piece of paper with a stickers, a couple of stickers mm-hmm. on it. You're exactly right. And, uh, you know, so because, Joe, you hit the nail on the head, that those are going to be very easy to duplicate. We've already, again, over in the Springfield, Missouri area, we heard about somebody selling those on social media. So uh, the FBI is saying, look, if you do this, if you if we find you selling these, that's a federal offense because you're 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 mimicking a federal agency, and um, again, you could be at I don't know what the penalties are, and who knows if it's more bark or bite, you know, when it comes down to it, or they're actually going to prosecute people for maybe selling these vaccine cards online. So 
Uh, yeah, and Jill makes a good point that, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who've gotten the vaccines. There's hundreds of millions of people who've already gotten at least one shot of it in their arm. But there are going to be hundreds of millions of others who may not do that and want to live their life and may want to go into that restaurant that says, hey, you have to have a vaccine passport. So again, that opens up this whole area for scammers to slide right in and to try to sell you something that uh, uh, may or may not work and B, may or, get, may or may not get you in trouble with-, with, with Well, yeah. And, and I see the market- I see the market for this. And, and again, focusing on seniors, I can see where they'd be vulnerable that even if they had in fact gotten a card, or at least gotten their vaccine, let's say. They may not mm-hmm. remember getting a card or they don't know where it is. So somebody calls and says, you know, do you have your passport? Yes, your your vaccine passport. And they say, well, what's that? They say, well, it's this document you've got to have. And and then right. they, they, they say, our records show that you've had the vaccine, to which the person will say, yeah, that's true. I have had it. Right. Well, uh, have you? did you receive your card? And they and they say, what card? And, and I can see how that would be an opportunity for someone to say, well, no, we can send you one, but it's twenty nine ninety five or $599. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. it could be a big number, right, to yes. pay for this and, card. And you make a great point, Joe. And again, they could couch it also by saying, well, if you want to be able to see your family on a regular basis, you need to have this passport. You know, there's a number of different scare tactics that they can use. So I think, again, I don't know, again, we're, we're at the front of this because we're still being vaccinated and that the vaccine passport is just something that's being talked about in the media right now. But, um, you know, here in the next couple of months, that's a possibility for people to get scammed. And if you hear anybody offering you a vaccine passport, it's 100% scam right now. And, and again, we've already gotten reports on the Southwest part of the state of Missouri where people are selling those fake cards. So uh, again, uh, we at BBB, we wanna report what's happening in the now, but we also wanna make people ready for what's coming. And uh, because we've seen the different waves of, uh, um, of these scams during this pandemic, that's probably gonna be the next, I don't know if it's gonna be a big thing, but it's the next thing that could come across the, could come across the dial, if you will. And we had talked in the past about the fact that uh, it's almost a perfect storm for people who want to take advantage of older people over the past year. You've had fear, you've had isolation, yeah. Uh, you've had um, perhaps a deterioration to some extent of functionality that kind of comes with being isolated and not getting out and getting exercise. And, and so you have the conditions that are very ripe for someone to communicate and reach out to these people and to victimize them in some way. Very much so. And the isolation is the biggest part. They, and again, so a lot of these times you have seniors who are just happy to hear from someone. So they get these robocalls and, you know, all of a sudden they hear somebody on the other line. So they pick up and they talk to them and, uh, you know, they, they get they get taken in on these scams. And uh, again, uh, as I talked about earlier in the show, if you have somebody who's uh, uh, isolated and, and lives by themselves, uh, or even if they live in assisted living or something, it's been very difficult for you to be, actually have contact with them, physical contact, but you could still check in on them and try to check in on those folks as much as they can because uh, they're they're very vulnerable to these scammers without a doubt. Yeah. So aside from these uh, remote operators or these people who come in town and, and prey on people and then move on to the next town, um, what are the categories of businesses? I don't think we've ever asked you this. What are the categories of businesses that you most commonly get complaints about? People alleging that they were treated unfairly, or or they were could have been just really terrible service, um, or it could be on the, as far as to say that there was fraud, uh, bad products, etc. Tell me what are the really suspect industries or the suspect categories of businesses? The suspect category in 2020, without a doubt, was online purchasing. Online, um, you know, online entities just sprang up out of nowhere. And people, not only seniors, but uh, the general populace, including seniors, were spending their money with people they didn't know. And uh, if you want to do a COVID hook to that, again, we saw a lot of things in March and April and May of people spending money with people who were trying to sell this personal protective equipment. Right. Uh, they were basically selling these face masks and gloves and stuff and this, uh, uh, you know, things to help keep your hands clean and those sanitizer uh, without really even having it. So, uh, and again, seniors are really susceptible to that because 
all the stuff we heard a year ago was, and again, it's, it still rings true today, is that seniors are the most susceptible to dying of COVID. So if I'm a senior citizen, 75, 80 years old, who is, you know, if, if you get COVID and you're in that age bracket, it's particularly harmful to you. I would have been really on the phone or on the internet or having somebody try to help me get these, get this, get this equipment. So uh, online without a doubt has been, has been really big thing uh, across the board over the last 12 months. Okay. And now what would be another couple of categories? Let's see other, other industries where we get um, a lot of, comp- of course, you know, vacation timeshares is something. We, I was we, just going to say, was it t- vacation properties? Ha- yeah, have those been it, selling more during this period of time? So we just we just did a uh, we just did a news release on one not too long ago that's uh, a consumer warning on a business that was selling back around 2005 and six they were selling vacation uh, plans like they would help you get uh, cheap hotel rates and plane rates and those types of things they're selling them for 199 dollars a year well as you can suspect during COVID there was no one traveling anywhere so this company appears to have gone to uh, uh, back to its uh, roles of people who used to be their customers and are trying to say they owed them a lot of back money. So people were getting uh, mailers for two and three thousand dollars saying, hey, you owe us memberships from 2005 all the way to now or 2011 wow. to now. So uh, and again, those are mostly going to senior citizens. So, uh, you know, we've, we've seen that vacation, the vaca- vacation timeshare industry uh, again is big. Those timeshare exit businesses that we've talked about before, where people go to the, even, mm-hmm. believe it or not, even during this pandemic, they're still having those quote unquote chicken dinners where they get people a free meal and they bring them up front to, uh, to, to, to tell them about how they can get out of their timeshare for, uh, you know, like that when it's never like, like that. that. So There's always uh, a catch. So, but, yes. but, but we should say something on behalf of the, the businesses that, that try to do that correctly. And tell me what those characteristics would be. Uh, what, what, what would you look for if it were your mother and she signed one of these contracts, meaning a contract with the, the, the timeshare purchase. Mm-hmm. And so she feels captive to writing this you know, several thousand dollar check a year mm-hmm. And you want or to the maintenance t- fees, yes. Yeah, maintenance fees. And you want to turn to somebody to help her possibly get out of that. What would be the characteristics that you would expect in a in a straight up operation helping people free themselves? Well, the first thing I would ask my mom to do would be to go back uh, to the company that she bought it from and say, hey, do you have an exit plan? Especially they've been members for a long time. A lot of the bigger plant companies now have their own exit program. Um, to do to go to a third party to do that. The only thing I would trust is somebody who would not take that upfront fee, because if you're going to take four or five thousand dollars upfront from someone, then what is your motivation to do anything after that? You've already got your money. So if if it's a company that's going to say, you know what, uh, Mr. O'Brien, we're going to take your D, we're going to take your case. You don't have to pay anything until we're all done with our work. And again, I'd be I would be comfortable with that because I know that this company is going to work for me. And they'll get their carrot once the work is done rather than eating it up front and not having to do any work on the backside. So if you can find a company like that, that would be something certainly one that doesn't have an upfront fee would be one that you can put some trust in to know that they're going to actually try to work for you and help you get you out of this situation. And in those situations with those companies that take the upfront fee, what happens is you don't get that fee back if they don't deliver, if they don't sell your timeshare. Is that correct? Uh, if the, if we, we found that a lot of consumers who pay that upfront fee do not get their, even if, you know, we've had, there's one company that, uh, that which I've talked to consumers from who are waiting now four and five years after the fact that they've had their money tied up and they still have the kind the timeshare contract. So, you know, let's say they, they, one instance, I know I have a consumer from 2016 who paid one of these companies like $3,000 to get them out of the timeshare. It didn't happen. They've tried to get out of uh, that contract with that timeshare exit company, but the timeshare exit company says no. We we haven't exhausted all of our avenues, and what they continue to do is try to find other people to help them take on this case. And meanwhile, this person thought they're going to be out of their timeshare in six months. All of a sudden, they've got 2017 fees, 2018, yeah. 2019. So they continue to pay these fees for something they can't use because. They're not supposed to use the product if they're not going to, if they're trying to get out of it. To, yeah. uh, and, so it's just, it's just a big mess. And, and what's, what's interesting about that is um, when you listen to some of the ads that are ran 
and I, I listen to ads closely because I, I do ads in very, my various businesses and through Cordell and Cordell, of course. So, you know, I listen for credibility. I, I try to be a, a critical listener. And, and I've heard a few of those ads that sounded pretty good. But, you know, one of the, the loose ends was whenever they assure you, as they do, I'm thinking of one ad in particular, where a guy's speaking, he says, look, our goal is to get you out of this if we can. He says, if we can't get you out, you get your money back. And it, it's, the guy's voice sounds very credible. You know, the, the ad seems credible. And, the, and, and his promise seems safe. But it's not safe if there's no deadline meaning that they take your money and, yes, we'll give it back if we fail, but it may take us five or six but, years yeah. to figure out if we're going to fail. So I think that you've identified a critical component that people need to look for if they hire a company to help them get out from under this, and, and that's that there's got to be a deadline at which they get their money back. But even better is what you said earlier. Better is you don't pay them up front. But I'm wanting to be realistic, though. If, if, if you or I owned, Don, a business in which this is what we did, we, we tried to get people out, we would want to be sure we're going to get paid. Right. So I'm wondering, there are there some bona fide companies that do say, no, we want to be paid, but you know we will give it back to you. Give us 90 days. Give us six months. Give us nine months. Um, you know, I wonder, is there a way for, uh, for a business to realistically hope to get paid and at the same time people be safe to know they're not going to lose their money. Yeah, that's where the business has to have trust in the consumer they're dealing with, that the consumer is actually going to pay them at the end of those things rather than expecting all that up front. So uh, unfortunately, as, as an investigator for Better Business Bureau, I only really hear the bad things about these companies. A lot of people who have, who are on the, the, the bad end of these deals um, and, uh, you know, that, that the experiences that I talk to with consumers aren't usually very good ones. Um, you know, the, the other way you could go, uh, with one of these things, if you're going to, if you want to pay somebody up front, uh, that uh, that's going to help you try to get you out of timeshare. Uh, Joe, you're a lawyer. You've got ethics. You have to stand up to you. You know, if if you're going to take money from somebody, you have to do the work for them. So if you can find a timeshare lawyer, uh, if you're wanting to pay somebody up front to do that type of work, that might be a little bit safer than these folks that don't that that say they have these these tie-ins uh, to the, the the resorts when they really don't. Uh, you know, if you're able to, to actually pay for legal counsel, I talk to a lot of people every day and 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 talk, tell them that look, if you talk to legal counsel, you have somebody you can talk to who might be legal able to help you. If you're a, if Joe, you know, you would, what would happen, Joe, to you if you took some money up front for somebody and didn't do any work for them? See, that's probably, it. That that and you raise a good point is that if somebody hires a lawyer to do this work, and and let me let me hurry to tell people. Lawyers only know particular areas of the law. It's impossible for a lawyer, no matter how smart they are, to be really good in a bunch of different things. The law is just too mm -hmm. complex. It's like being a great doctor. There's no yep. way that— You that, could have every area of mes yeah, medicine covered. Exactly. Yeah. So, so laws like that. And, um, it, but yet there are strict rules. So if you can find a, a, a lawyer who's done this, does this sort of work— they have familiarity with it. it might be a debt or credit or lawyer. They're, that's a specialty for lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, but you're correct that there is a safety there. Now, some people may say, well, my lawyers bill too much. Well, there may I, mean, I know some of that goes on in the industry among lawyers, but I will tell you this, that there are definite constraints on that. And in answer to your question, if you take money from somebody, say that you take a retainer, with a lawyer would call it, which means you've not forfeited it. A retainer, you have to give back what it isn't, you'd have it accounted for with billed hours, or which should be to the tenth of an hour, or a a third or a fourth of an hour. But so they they take this retainer and they look into it. They do the things they're going to do, and and presumably they get it done because they will have told you on the front end, this is my estimate. So usually lawyers don't want that to be in concrete, but they know that they're going to be hoisted by their petards if they tell you my estimate for this work is $5,000 and they come along and say, I need 10. Uh, so lawyers are very self, self-conscious self about being in the ballpark of what they, they right. if they give an estimate. Sometimes they won't give an estimate because it's litigation. Litigation yeah. is a weird thing. So, so here's what's nice about dealing with a lawyer is you can report them to the bar. 
Yep. And and when they report to the bar, let me tell you, that's not blown off. There's an investigation, no. and if and there's lay people that that sit on this committee. So if if they feel that there's something that's not right, then then there will be a, a hearing, and ultimately you can be censured, which is a public reprimand, which is a big deal if you're a lawyer. Doesn't uh, look good. Nobody wants that wants that to ever happen to them. And then of course the worst scenario is you get to bar- disbarred, which means you lose your profession. So y- your point is good that. That a lawyer may be one of your best sources if if you're in a situation involving timeshares. Just be sure it's a lawyer that does this area. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And you can find those, you know, BBB, you know, obviously you can find a lot of stuff, information on BBB, but that would be uh, certainly a, certainly a, a, an outlet for you rather than uh, paying somebody $5,000 up front and they're not accountable to anybody. At least that lawyer, as you said, is accountable to uh, the bar and his peers and his, his or her reputation uh, is at stake if they don't do what they say they're going to do. And Don, if you do use the Timeshare company, I, I think it's really important to know what steps they're going to take in an effort to sell your timeshare. I mean, are they just going to put it on Craigslist? Have them give details on how they are going to go about taking this timeshare off your hands. Now, you're talking about timeshare exit company. Yes, exit company. I know that people watching this is confusing because when we first talked about this subject several months back, um, you can easily think that we're talking about the timeshare company. We have complaints about them, too. Right, we have, right. We have, we have a lot right. of complaints about the timeshare company. And then, ironically, though, which somebody would think, well, that's what we're going to talk about. No, we're talking about the the, 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 the the next victimizer, which is not them. It's the people who are coming along and say, look, let me rescue you. You know, we'll mm-hmm. rescue you. And then, Get you out of this. And that's been the focus of our conversation here. But but let, let's shift back, though, to the timeshare company itself. Um, one thing that, that has not made sense to me is that the business model is not such a bad business model. It didn't have to be a corrupt thing where people no. sign into something that that they just they can't free themselves of. It's like indentured servitude in terms of writing these these checks every year. It didn't have to be that. That that business model could have been a very good business model where people buy this ownership of an interest and they buy several weeks and you have colors coded where your the cost of your weeks depends upon is it going to be popular or not and there could have been an exit strategy without the accompanying bonds or or the um the the commitment from which you couldn't extricate yourself until death and then for some families beyond death because the 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 family that would have inherited this, didn't know that they didn't have to sign this new contract, that they had no duties at all under this. But they're led to believe, perhaps by being contacted shortly after the death of a loved one, that they need to follow up and sign the execute this new contract. And what they do is commit themselves afresh to the thing that they would otherwise have been free from at the death of, for example, their mother or Mm -hmm. their grandmother. Um, So, is is it? Are you seeing now emerge a uh, a business model or business practices in the timeshares themselves, not the exit companies, which is intended to create happier customers over time? Yeah, I, I think again, it kind of circles back to what I talked to right when we first kind of started the segment a little bit was the fact that now a lot of the bigger timeshare companies, those front end salespeople, they do not like the reputation that these exit companies have kind of given them because they didn't have this these easy exits for their consumers. Their customers were all of a sudden saying, hey, you've got me over a barrel here. This guy over here says he's going to be able to help me out, get out underneath that barrel. So a lot of the bigger ones, I know that uh, uh, Wyndham, for example, has its own exit program. Diamond is another big one that has its own exit program. Uh, I believe Holiday Inn Vacation Club has their own exit program now. So that's, you know, in order to take advantage of those, though, you have to be kind of most free and clear. You almost only have to be paying maintenance fees at that point. You, yeah, they, they want to make sure they got all your money before they try to let you out. Right. So there may be in the future a an industry of timeshare that where it won't be such a terrible idea, which heretofore – my advice to anybody that has talked to me about this topic is that it's a really bad idea. And, um, and, and yet what, what clutters that argument up in the minds of some people who are considering it is they'll know somebody, they'll know an aunt Mildred or some friends in California who signed up for one and used it every year. 
without complication. They loved it. They wanted to go to the same mm-hmm. place every year, and it worked. Or for a co-host, meaning uh, me. Okay. I'd forgotten you did yes. get into this. Mm-hmm. And you were relatively happy, though? At first, um, went into it with some friends, and then the fees kept going up and up and up. And yeah. But, but you quit being happy at some point. Yes. How many years in? I would say four years in. Well, there are people who, and I'm thinking of a couple right now, good friends of, of ours in St. Charles County, who last time I talked to them, they were about 20 years in. They were still happy. But here's, here's what people have to understand. For every one customer like that, there are, it's not an exaggeration to say there are 20, maybe 25 or more who regret. And you would be in that category because, I mean, after four years, you regretted it, four or five. So, right. so the, the, the only way that, that you win in, with, these, with the contracts, the historical contracts, is that you stay in that, that please state for the balance of your lives yeah. because that, that's what you're stuck with. Well, and the fees kept going up and then just poor customer services, uh, not delivering on what we were init- initially promised. So... Like what? Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't get the, the quality of unit that you expected? Well, yeah, or they would say you could use your point system for, you know, whatever, and then you'd call to make that appointment, and it was hit or miss of getting a competent uh, customer service agent, and they would say no, and then you'd be on the phone two hours, and then finally hang up, and then you'd call back another time, and you'd talk to somebody else, and they would tell you the absolute opposite. It's like nobody was on the same page. Now, are you comfortable mentioning who that was? Uh, as long as we don't get sued. You've not accused them of fraud. You just said that. Okay. You didn't get good uh, service. Yes, Vacation Village. I don't know that one, but um, I would think some of the really big names, as you indicated, you know, why would they want this black eye? Yeah. Uh, like Wyndham. And there are even very similar things. I don't know that Ritz Carlton had what you call a timeshare, but it was a concept that was similar to that at one time. Now, maybe they've discontinued it, but the point is Marriott, Disney, I mean, they have, they do this and you would think that they would want to do it in a way that didn't have that sort of stench to it. Yeah. That people associate. Tarnish their name. Yeah. You know. Yeah. They, they, they want customers for life. Yeah. I'm hopeful that timeshare is starting to evolve a little bit now and that you know, right now when you buy one of these timeshares, you there the ending there's no end date. You don't there's not there's not a smooth, for most parts a smooth exit. So hopefully, especially the bigger the bigger actors are now trying to make it okay. Here's where you're in up front. Here's where you in, and when you want to get out, here's what you have to do at the end. So that way, it's some you know when people get into that, uh, they they can they can know that there is an ending in sight. Because the one thing about timeshare is a lot of people don't recognize it. What might sound good when you're 28 with one or two young kids isn't going to be the same at 68 when you're uh, all of a sudden, you know, you're 40 years into it and those kids are now grandkids. And, you know, maybe you have a place that's going to be wonderful for you. But again, eventually your life changes and what you do in the moment of paying that hefty up that hefty fee for that timeshare uh, holding, it's going to change as your life changes. And unfortunately, those, as Joe pointed out, those maintenance fees all they do has been going up yeah. and, uh, you know, you get a lot of unsatisfied customers as a result of that. So it'd be nice if there's some kind of an end game for that, uh, for that timeshare, uh, s- seller that the, the person that the company that sells that timeshare, their customer knows there's a way for them to exit if they do right. a, B and C. Right. And, and, and it's not as if the people who sell these wouldn't be in a better position to make money from them than anyone else, because the people who sell them, assuming they, they own this facility, th- this residual facility, then they have two weeks to rent out. So if they buy it, then they can turn around and rent out right. those rooms with or without a timeshare status. Yeah. Uh, so it does make sense that they're the one party involved here who would be in the best position to simply say, look, after five years, we will promise to give you back 80% of what you paid if you choose, or even 100%, depending on whether it's inflation. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't, I don't be a much better any, business model, but yeah, who knows? Any, any business is going to do that. But, uh, you know, 
uh, it would be nice if there is a if there is an easier way for people to exit out of these because again, what it's done is sprung up this cottage industry, which for whatever reason, a lot of those businesses are in here in Missouri, and uh, we've taken a ton of complaints about them, and there have been millions upon millions of dollars that have been lost by consumers uh, to these third party exit companies, which which consumers tell us do little or no work on their behalf. It's right. a shame. It's this double whammy. I mean, they no. first get 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 hit with buying this timeshare and then they're they're searching for a rescuer and they the people they turn to they find that they're victims of this it's really sad yeah a lot yeah. of deception are, are a lot of these people older well, that, oh yes this is this is primarily yeah seniors are are victimized uh, by these timeshare exit companies uh because what they're told they're told magical things that these uh chicken dinners as i talked about earlier they're they're, they're told that uh uh, you know, they're going to be able to get them out under this, uh, out from under this uh, shadow. They're going to, um, one of the, one of the scare pictures that's used by these exit companies is that these things are going to transfer on to your children or your grandchildren, and you need to help them not have that. And of course, again, they're preying on their fears when Joe, you, you pointed out earlier that that's not true at all, but they think that it is. So yeah. uh, yes, again, we have a, we have a population that's very trusting of people and their word is bond, and they and and if somebody if they got a likable young person up there is telling them things that's going to help them out, and they then they they build that trust in them quickly. They're gonna hand, they're gonna hand over that money, and uh, unfortunately, they're gonna be stuck with uh, a lot of headaches over the next months and years. And the timeshare still. Yeah. Good topic. Um, I I think timeshares have to be something that occupies as much of your all's time as any other single product out there. Would you say? It does. It does. I, as an investigator, again, we, uh, I've been with BBB, uh, since 2017. We shortly after I arrived, we, we merged with the Springfield BBB. And for whatever reason, a lot of these timeshare exit companies are down in the Southwest part of the state, we have a couple actors in, in St. Louis, but most of them are in that set in that Southwest Missouri area. And it's been, it's almost like whack-a-mole. You get one down, another one pops yeah. back up. So, um, and you know, uh, Joe, you talk about these, uh, uh, you know, you're sold one thing and then there's another thing that pops up to get money out of you. Well, the, the people that are running these timeshare exit companies, guess what they used to sell? Timeshares. Timeshares. So, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I was going to say uh, a mailing list. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Timeshares. So they had, they go from one, they go from the, the front end to the back end. Back end. So um, it's, uh, you know, it can be very costly. So again, uh, you know, if you need any information about timeshares, go to bbb.org because we've got a ton of information on there about those. That's a great point to wrap up with. Yes. It's good that we have the Better Business Bureau, um, Don O'Brien. And I think that people who want to follow up, they can certainly contact you directly. Is that correct? Yes, you betcha. So, uh, but you can also go to our site and we'll provide a link over to yours as well. Very good. Yeah. My, I'll, I'll get my phone number out real quick because I don't mind it. I, I would love to help anybody out there. You can give me a 314-584-6785. Again, that's 314-584-6785. Uh, you know, if you're if you're in a pickle with something or you just need no information about whether it's timeshares or whatever else, that's what they pay me for. All right. Don, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Always a great Thanks. guest. Lots of good media information to protect seniors. I appreciate you guys having me and looking forward to our next chat. Yep, we'll do it Sounds again. Sounds good. So this has been another episode of Elder Talk. Till next time, take care. You've been listening to Elder Talk with Tucker Ellen, providing intelligent answers for those thinking about their future with attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. For more information, visit tuckerallen.com. Listen again next Saturday for another edition of Elder Talk with Tucker Allen. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.